Hey everybody, this is Matthew Krauss, and you are listening to the podcast Working Drummer. Today is my interview with Travis McNabb. For a little over 13 years, Travis was the drummer with the rock band Better Than Ezra. In mid-2007, he joined the band Sugarland and worked with the duo for many years, up until their recent hiatus. He's continued to work with both of the artists, including Christian Bush, and most recently he did some session work with Jennifer Nettles, and you can hear Travis's playing on her most recent single. Currently, Travis is out touring with an up-and-coming country artist, Frankie Ballard. So in this interview, I'm splitting it up into two parts. I've done this once before, and I've decided to do it again. Uh, the interview went a bit long, but Travis has shared some really great stories that I think are really important to just split that up and make sure that I can share everything that we talked about. Uh, it was great. Both parts are great, and uh, I encourage you to check them both out. And so here is part one, and I'll have part two next week for you. As always, you can go to workingdrummer.net. You can find us on Twitter at working underscore drummer. We're on Instagram. You can find us on Facebook. You can leave a comment, questions. You can subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, where a new episode will be sent to your smart device every week. So let's get right to it. Here is part one of Travis McNabb. The more you can watch and listen back or whatever the whatever the medium is you know and really take it in as as an outsider after you've done the work the more you learn like you learn every time i mean with sugarland the band leader and i scott patton's his name uh would get because we were you know we had a lot of video as part of our thing, you know. So we were fortunate it wasn't even just the old board tape, but it was video and oh audio gosh. from the show yeah. every night. And he and I would, you know, we'd get on the bus after showering and whatever, uh, winding down. You're on the bus maybe an hour, hour and a half after you played every night, and we'd watch that video every night of what we just did. Holy moly. And man. you learn so much, and you, and it, you constantly improve from it. You yeah, know? So yeah. it's it's that sort of, you know, um you know, it's easy to think it's self-indulgent, but really it is sort of part of the gig. It's a learning tool, a valuable one. Mm -hmm. you know? so, right, right. Yeah, yeah. I think that it's so much of a learning tool mm -hmm. that there's times that I'm thinking, okay, I should be recording this. And I go through these spurts where I'll I'll bring this little task cam recorder mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and run a line out of my mixer mm -hmm. or even just set it down depending mm -hmm. on the room mm -hmm. or the gig. Yeah. And – uh and sometimes it's a tough pill to swallow. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. People don't want to do it because it's because they find out just how far from what they think they're doing they are. Mm -hmm. But man, you gotta you gotta suck that up and learn from it because otherwise right. you ain't gonna get there. You right. know. I mean, it's I remember being sixteen, you know, and recording myself playing with a stereo with a boombox just to see <laughs> what's going on, you know? Yeah, and it's, yeah. I mean, you learn so much that way. So. And sometimes there's the, the positive aspect of it, too, is, is you maybe do something spontaneous and you're like, hey, that really works. Mm -hmm, or mm -hmm. we tried something new tonight and, and mm -hmm. uh, I wouldn't have thought that would have worked, but it's yeah. sounding good. It was sort of know, discovery, happy accident, all that sort of thing. Yeah, Right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, how long uh, were you with uh, Sugarland? Sugarland was probably about six and a half-ish years, somewhere yeah. in there. Uh -huh. um, I started up with them uh, about a um, – well, right – I want to say it was summer of 07, maybe, something like that, okay. um, up until their hiatus, which was end of 2012, I think, something. Yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, uh, up until they went on the kind of break they're on now. You yeah. Know? So right, right. Um, it was right before they started doing their own headline touring, I came on board, um, it, which was, you know, fortunate timing for me. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it looked like, actually, I was, I was supposed to come on about a year earlier and um, – uh, um, at that time, I'd been in the band Better Than Ezra for. I, or I assume we're going on this thing now. Yeah. Yeah, okay. That's all good. I, I like the not not declaring it. That's nice. Um, <laughs> yes. Uh, I and Better Than Ezra had kind of we'd reached a point. I'd been in the band ten years plus by that point. We pretty much toured the whole time, whether we had a current single or album out at the moment or not. We just always really made our living touring. Right. And so we got we hit a point where all of us decided. Let's you know, kind of take a break for a minute, and we'll still still do occasional shows. Not a complete stop the band, but like not full on touring. 
it doesn't have to be all of our first priority. If if good shows or offers or short runs come along that we decide we want to all do and we're all mm-hmm. in, great. But let's all pursue some other stuff for a year or two and then reconvene and decide what the future is for the band. Yeah. And so um, we had made that decision. We were finishing up touring for what was our current album at that time, finished promoting it. I, and I had been asked to do the Sugarland thing. Uh, and <clears throat> was committed to doing it, but I wasn't supposed to start for another month or six weeks. J.J. Johnson, who was playing for them at the time, was, I think, going back out with John Mayer, maybe. But he wasn't leaving until then, and I was still finishing up Ezra dates, So it was all yeah, lining yeah, up. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, um, the TV show Desperate Housewives had just had their big first season. And... Uh, um, and and they were about to come with their second season. It was the new hot show. And they started using a song from the most recent, at that time, Better Than Ezra record, as a song that wasn't a single or anything, just off the album, sure. as the, pro, all the promos for the coming season of this hot show. And so the label's like, well, if they're using this on this ad campaign, we got to, you know, we're going to promote it as a single. We're going to make a video. You guys got to keep touring. Yeah. And so the other guys in the band came to me and said, I know we all agreed we're taking this break. We all said it's cool you go do this Sugarland thing, but man, we got this opportunity. We can't not do it, you know. And mm-hmm. so, and I was really ready for something different. I mean, I just I love those guys, and they're still my good friends. And I still sub shows for them, and mm-hmm. you know, we're still I'm on the board of a charity we have in New Orleans <laughs> right, still. Right. But uh, but at that point, I was just ready. We were all ready to pursue other things, and yeah. I'd committed to this thing, and I was excited about it. I'd learned the music, and. Um, and but I knew they were right. I mean, I'm a member of that band, and I, you know, and I'd been there for over a decade, and and we have this opportunity to pursue. And so I felt terrible, but and I knew they had Sugarland had enough time to find somebody else. I knew it wasn't leaving anyone in a lurch, but mm-hmm. but I still, for me, I was just ready to do it. Plus, I I was afraid I was burning a bridge by backing out, but it's what I had to do. So I, uh, you know, so Ezra continued touring and and. You know that didn't turn into a giant hit or anything, but so whatever. You stayed with them. I stayed with them, and I okay. backed out of the Sugarland tour thing. Okay, and um, uh, and so they, you know, um, they carried on and and found someone else to to fill the slot. And uh, um, about a year later, um, you know, and I explained my position, and I felt like they understood, but I had history with Christian, which we can talk about. That's part of my mm-hmm, connection mm-hmm, there. Mm-hmm. So I think he really understood, and he and I had a deeper conversation about it. But Jennifer had only kind of met a couple of times. I didn't know her well. And so for all I know, I'm just that dude that said he'd come on tour and didn't. If, you know, that might right, be how right. she views me. I didn't know. And um, and But about a year later, they were doing some recording, and uh, – and I got called to come do the session. And this uh, is 2010. No, this was this was about this was earlier than that. Okay. Um, this was for they were putting out a special like Christmas version at some certain store only with bonus Christmas tracks of their second album. And so they were recording those Christmas songs, some of which wound up on a whole Christmas album they did later, but but they were just recording a handful of Christmas songs for that special edition of the second album. So this was probably, this was in 07. 07. Right. And, uh, and um, so I was on the session, and things went well. It moved quicker than expected, and... Uh, so we're done, and the other players are leaving, and they asked me, well, so what are you doing now? And I, and this is in Atlanta, and I was living in New Orleans at the time, mm-hmm. so I thought they meant literally. I'm like, oh, because we're done earlier than expected yeah. today. you know. Yeah. So oh, I'll probably go see a movie or something. And they say, <laughs> no, 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 what are you doing with your career right now? What's going on? You know. And so I said, you oh, said, well, no, I'm going to go see a movie. I'm going to go see That's it. <laughs> done. Uh, no, so they, uh, I, you know, uh said with that break I was supposed to take a year ago, we're actually taking it now. And so yeah. then they asked me, okay, well, would you like to come out on the road? And so nice. uh, I was, I felt very fortunate. And I got that second chance. And, and in talking to them later about it, once I'd been there for a long right, time, right. I think they did appreciate the fact that I sort of, um, my reasoning, I think, I guess they thought was valid or the right move as far as even though I was, had told them I'd do their thing and then didn't do it initially, they understood 
you know, I'm, I'm in this band. These are my brothers. I've been a part of this a long time, and we have yeah, this opportunity. Yeah. I can't just not do it with yeah. them. So, in other words, the bridge I was afraid I was burning, but I tried to explain myself well at the time. Sure. Turns out they, they got it, and it was okay. And, yeah. you know, and so that led to getting to be a part of that Sugarland thing, you know, for the whole rest of the time they were doing it up until this break they're on. That's so, awesome. Yeah, yeah. And I want to talk a little bit more about that relationship you had mm-hmm. with Christian, yeah. uh, because I don't know if that was a, a part of them saying, "Hey, this is great. Uh, he's going to go do this thing," but let's always keep him. You know, I know Travis. What's that? It, it could there? be it, that could be part of it. Is Christian? Yeah. Uh, we knew each other from when we were both in our early twenties, uh, which would be in the early nineties in Georgia. Um, we played music together in a duo he had called Billy Pilgrim. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so, you know, we had history together and we hadn't played music together in a long time, but we'd remain friends over all that mm-hmm. time. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so I think maybe that could be part of the equation. And also actually Kristen Hall, the third original member of right. Sugarland, mm-hmm. I had played on a record for her in about 91 or so and had history with her as well. Yeah, yeah. Cause she was also out of that same uh, D- Decatur slash Atlanta, Georgia singer songwriter scene. Yes. Um, and so I, I was involved in that scene at that time and uh, didn't know Jennifer from then. I was aware of her, but I knew Kristen and Christian had played and recorded with both of them mm-hmm. and also other people from that, you know, Sean Mullins and, you know, other uh, artists that sort of came out of what was a, a singer songwriter folk pop acoustic scene is the indigo girls mm-hmm. uh, is that where that, that it all kind of grew out of their success that yeah. whole scene there i read that yeah. uh, when i was kind of doing some mm-hmm. research on you and, and yeah uh, yeah it, I, I hate to use the word guilty pleasure because yeah, I, well, I don't feel guilty don't feel at guilty all. yeah yeah, yeah. I, i'm a huge indigo girls yeah I have yeah, been yeah for for so long same um, here yeah and uh so when i read that and you had worked with them and I was like, oh, yeah I, I mean and it's not like i worked with them extensively i did one recording with them one time yeah, uh, sure. when I was at that time in the early 90s and um, when I was there in that scene and I was not only playing with a lot of those acts and I was in a in a band as well of my own or mm-hmm. that I was a member of but I was also doing um, sort of playing shows and doing a lot of recording with all of these what were mostly singer songwriter solo artists or duos small acts that mm-hmm. when they wanted a full band sound I was the guy playing drums with a lot of them yes. and I was also working as a recording engineer uh, at a studio that a lot of them worked at um, and so I wound up playing on a lot of their records that way yeah. um, and so uh, but that was my original connection to Christian Bush was um, and and therefore to Sugarland with between Kristen and Christian was just being a part of that yeah, that scene at that time, and um, you know, and that's one of those examples of you never know where something's leading. You know, right. Um, right. I mean, we ha- when I got the call about Sugarland, Christian and I hadn't played music since probably I don't know the the uh, two thousand you know five or six or something, and then here it is ten years later plus, and he's calling. You know, and so right. I think. Uh, you know, just be nice to everybody, and you never know where stuff's going to lead. You know, sure. Um, uh, in fact, and that that sort of uh, relates to another thing that I think is important to know. I remember uh, reading when I was younger, you know, teenager and modern drummer Kenny Arnoff talking about being replaced on the first John Mellencamp record, and yes. and and sort of. Sticking to it anyway, not not letting it be a, a de- be dejected and go home, but like let me learn from this, you know. Yeah. And I had a similar experience with Kenny. Um, I had been playing, doing that whole scene I was just talking about, and then Christian and his partner Andrew and Billy Pilgrim got a record deal with Atlantic Records. I think it was Atlantic, and uh, a major label deal. And so now they've got big money, and and they're 22 or whatever, so they hire their hero, Kenny Arnoff, to play on their record. Right. Now, granted, I wasn't in their band, but whenever they played with full band or whenever they recorded, I recorded with them. Yeah. Um, I was in another band, but still, I was kind of part of their thing, and we were all buddies. And uh, and then they hire Kenny Arnoff, and you know, bruised my ego a little bit at the time. But it so happens they hire the very same guy. That I read this interview about it happening to him, and I thought, let me learn from this example, yes. you know. Yes. And I went to the studio and I watched him work, and he was very kind and 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 you know, 
not only did I witness him do it, but he told me, I'm just playing the stuff you played on the demos. I just happened to be fortunate enough to have this name and whatever, you know. Yeah, but, yeah. but he was very encouraging and very yeah. cool. And yeah. and I wound up playing a little bit on the record. And, and, you know, so all of that was valuable to me, not only at that moment, but also if I had a let my ego get the better of me and say, right. well, screw you guys. That's not cool, blah, blah, blah. Then I'm not still friends with Christian Bush 10 years later when he calls me to play with Sugar Lamb. Yeah. You know, so yeah. I, I think all of that is is sort of... Um, that turned you know, into recordings, not only touring, yeah, but, but opportunity to play on absolutely. the tracks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I was, felt very fortunate as far as, yeah, Sugar Land, um, as my relationship with them developed, they wound up using me in the studio, uh, you know... Um, on a lot, most of, you know, they, they did a record right after I started playing with them that I didn't play on, but almost everything after that I played on with them. So, wow. yeah. So, and then okay. since then I've recorded both with Christian and Jennifer individually. They each called on me both to play live stuff and, and on record with them. That's so, great. Yeah. You know, so I read there was a 2010 record that you were kind of the primary drummer on that. Yeah. Or that's the way it was listed. Yeah. No, that's mind. right. Uh, the, the last, um, the last record they put out yeah. uh, um, on all but I think one track, maybe. Um, they, is Kenny they, on that track? They, uh, no, <laughs> that would be funny if it was him. No, it was actually uh, one of my favorites. It was Matt Chamberlain. Um, and they brought him in to play on a handful of things, but I think they only wound up using one or maybe two, but I think one. I'm not sure. Uh, oh, no, there. that's right. He's on one, and then there's one track we're both on together. So that's kind of fun. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Matt has to be mentioned at, at every podcast. So you've Probably, already, yeah. You've, uh, there we go. We've checked that box. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm a fan of, I mean, I just love his playing, you know, yeah. the tones, the feel, the everything, the parts, the ideas, you right, know, right, right. Uh, all of it's so good. Um, uh, I'm I, – I, a lot of the things or ways he approaches things feel very familiar to me. I think I'm just – I'm a less schooled and a, a little harder hitting uh, guy. But otherwise, I, I, I think there's a lot of things we have in common as far as approach or at least mm -hmm. that, that – it feels that way to me. When I hear him play, it feels mm -hmm. – uh, there's a, a musical familiarity mm -hmm. or that I appreciate or that yeah. I enjoy because it feels like it comes from some of the same ins uh, inspirations that I have yeah. or whatever, you know. He is def he's one of my favorites, too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I, I like to take whatever I can just by listening to him. And, mm -hmm. and there's times mm -hmm. before a session or maybe a new show or a new person I'm working with that mm -hmm. I will get out lots of recordings that he's mm -hmm. been on and just – yeah. Just listen, just listen. Uh huh. And he's just one of those I'll guys. Tell you what, man, that's a valuable tool too. Is to in preparing for something, mm -hmm. kind of listening to stuff that you want to guide you, even in a subconscious way. Not even purposely picking up particular things, but like when I find I've been playing too busy lately, and I'm about to go play on a record, I want to remind myself that f making stuff feel great is important, but stay, mm -hmm. but don't play a bunch of unnecessary stuff. I'll listen to. Uh, you know, John Mayer Continuum or something, yeah. you know, like yeah. something that's just totally just grooving yeah. with no uh, drummer fancy pantsness, just like, yeah. ju but just feels badass, you know, yeah. and, and, it, and is just totally serving the song, you know, uh, you know, and just, and that's one example. There's all kinds of that notion of, but it's, it's borrowing or, or reminding yourself of an approach. Right. When you're as you're gearing up to go into a certain situation, you know, there's an engineer producer that I work with every once in a while, and I put on a lot of the later Beatle records mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. listen to before I mm -hmm. go work with him. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I know yeah. what a fan he is. Right, right, right. And so if they it'll, have a it'll to do a song without the hi hat, right, in the verse, right, right. Yeah, yeah, he's totally. Like, yeah, I don't hear anything from him. He's like, great. He loves it. He's down. <laughs> That's cool. That's awesome. Yeah, uh, or it'll even inform you subconsciously, tonally. You know, you wind up oh, with yeah. tea towels on the drums or oh, whatever yeah, it is. For you sure. know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and it works yeah. out so nice. Uh huh. I want to ask you about what's going on right now. So are oh, you okay. out with Christian? Right I'm now? not out with Christian now. Um, I was for about a year there. I was juggling, and both artists were so kind to allow me to do this. I was playing with both Christian Bush and with uh, Big and Rich. And they would each allow me to sub because neither one was so busy that it that it was the only thing. But both were pretty busy. And, yeah. and so depending on 
kind of, uh, you know, if Christian has one date this weekend and Big and Rich has three, yeah. I go do Big and Rich. A, it's better for me. I'm making more. But B, I'm, I'm only subbing one show for Christian, you know. Yes, and so yes. they both kind of allowed me to do that for a while, which was, which was great. Um, but then uh, last summer... Um, I got an opportunity to go out with Gavin DeGraw, who I've, I didn't know well but have known for a long time through sort of the uh, 90s, early 2000s with Better Than Ezra. And Gavin was broke during that time, and we were on some same shows together. Okay. And so I was friends with some of the guys in his band and, and knew him a little bit and um, <clears throat> got asked to go out with him last summer. Yeah. And, uh, and I've just always – Loved his music and his voice. Amazing singer, you mm-hmm. know. Um, but they have a really strong band. And so that was exciting for me musically. I was into it. And so I took that gig, which meant that both um, Christian and Big and Rich, it, it wasn't a weekend warrior thing. It was like gone for months at a time kind of deal. Okay. Um, and so... The Gavin thing was. The Gavin thing was, gotcha. yeah. And uh, and so, um, so both Christian and Big and Rich had to find new guys. I couldn't just say, oh, Oh, you know, let me slide for a little while. It was, you know, I was gone. And right. so... Um, was that a tough decision to make or... A little bit. I mean, anytime you leave any gig, it's it's tough. Um, but I was such a fan of Gavin's thing that I, I really wanted to do it, you know. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and so uh, I knew that's what I wanted to do. And, and at this point, Christian Bush and I have so much history and such a strong friendship, yeah, you know, right, that right, right. he understood, you know, yeah. he totally understood. Um, and, 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 you know, John and Kenny, uh, Big and Rich, they were great about it. And, you know, and uh, I think they saw a handful of different guys, but, but uh, I, I was rooting for Keo. I'm happy yeah. he got it. Yeah, he is. And, right. uh, yeah, and he's uh, rocking it. He's, he's, he's killing really well it. He's, it. he's great. He's perfect for it. Mm-hmm. I think he's doing a great job. I think they're happy with him. Um, and I even kind of, I mean, I, I put a, a few names in the hat, and, mm-hmm. and um, anybody I'd recommend, I, I would give them the same advice. It wasn't just him, but I did try to tell him, I tried to say, you know, here's what I know John likes and try to give him a little whatever I knew from the gig. Not that it was super brilliant insights. Is there but, anything about like do you remember any of that advice or anything uh, that might be relevant? I think um, very general. I don't remember exactly what I told him, but I, I know generally because, uh, you know, John r- runs that show. I mean, it's John and Kenny, but John is sort of the – he's the guy, the – tip of the spear and John Rich and um, so you just watch him you follow him because he might turn on a dime play something he's never played before just be very cognizant of what he's doing and uh, and beat the hell out of everything and you know just play hard he just wants it to rock he just wants it to feel good yeah. you know and so playing the exact parts from the record aren't the con- isn't the concern it's like mm-hmm. just make it mm-hmm. you know and yeah they have a couple of ballads they'll play in the show and make those feel good too but but yeah. it, most of the show is very up tempo and it's just about making it exciting you know mm-hmm. that's more okay. important than like yeah. it, on that gig and every gig's yeah. different you know right. but on that gig yeah. the, just the the factor is is yeah. is the key I sure think, you know I think the reason I, I, I'm asking is that I know every gig is a little bit different and yeah. we're not talking about okay here's a podcast on if you were going to be playing with big and rich right right yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. but like what do you impart mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to this new drummer <laughs> who's coming into this new situation yeah yeah and I think I think when you're up for a gig or you're looking at a gig or you've been hired for a gig as I've been in a, in a uh, on a handful of occasions where I haven't met them. I might not get a rehearsal. Like with Big and Rich, there's no rehearsal, Mm -hmm. and I didn't know the guys. I had worked with Kenny, Big Kenny, one time before in the studio and then uh, uh, put together a band for him for one uh, benefit show. Mm -hmm. But this was four years earlier, and he he wasn't even aware I got hired for their gig, you know. So, And I didn't know anybody else, Mm -hmm. and I'm showing up, no rehearsal. And it's a giant country music festival in Canada, and – Here's new dude, you know, and so yeah, yeah. when that's the case, <clears throat> um, uh, I just try to do as much research as I can. Uh, what's really informative is video, and thank goodness for YouTube now. You know, I was going to ask you, how did you prepare? Was did yeah. anyone give you advice? Well, uh, only 
a bit of advice from the band leader, uh, the uh, bass player, Ethan Pilzer, who I didn't know at that time, but we've become good friends and played on a lot of gigs and sessions together since. Mm-hmm. Um, but, uh, you know, he gave me sort of the, the basic band leader advice. Um, but but it w- I learned m- more really from uh, – from just uh, reading about them to some degree, already having some awareness of what they were and what they were about, and I'd seen them live before, on festival dates or whatever. Um, but but also look you know looking up current video of what they're doing right now because they might not think to tell you every detail of things that are different from the record arrangements or, yes. or that kind of stuff. And yeah. so a lot of that just rather than assuming someone's going to tell you all that, the more you can take it on your shoulders to learn that stuff the better off you're going to be sure you know? sure um and so that was a that was a case where i did that you know um i did a similar thing i filled in for a little big town with uh, a handful of years ago for a little bit and but i had the good fortune of they had been touring with sugarland a lot so i saw their show every night you know so oh, i had cool. the i had the um the the background or the homework already there yeah. you know but big and rich or uh, did the same thing. I filled in for a while on a tour for Brendan Benson a few years ago, the guy from the Raconteurs, the other guitar oh, player right, besides right, Jack okay. White. Um, and that was something where I was familiar with his music, but I'd never seen him live. I didn't know that much, you know, about what he was doing mm-hmm. live. And and so um, you get what you can from the artist, uh, uh, what, however much information they provide you, but the rest of it's kind of on you to just yeah. do your do as whatever homework you can. This day and age, there's a lot of information available online, true, so true. go find it. You know? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, and you're not asking a bunch of questions or right. becoming a burden. Not no, that's that right. If that's, you need to, if you need to do it, but yeah. you also, yeah, you don't want to be the guy that's calling or texting constantly, like, well, what do y'all do on this? Blah blah blah. You know, or right, right. is is the tempo different than the record? I saw this live video, and it's three beats up from the record. No, whatever they're doing live now is what they're doing. Like, just mm-hmm. take that as the as gospel at the moment. Yeah. And when you get there and they say, you know, oh, well, we are doing that, but it's not intentional. Yeah, let's back it down. That's fine. You can sure, ask when you're there. Sure, but sure. but learn as much as you can and prepare. And I always try to learn the records and know the details there and learn whatever the current live thing is, whether they've given me stuff or, it's, or I'm finding it online. Mm-hmm. Be aware of both mm-hmm. and – if there are things they aren't doing from the record but I think are important or cool, I'll try and insert them. But use the live, current live situation as the sort of template. or right. That's what they're used to. Yeah. And your best bet is give them what they're used to. Yeah. You know? And so, if the YouTube video says 1995, you might yeah, that's take not that gonna, with a grain of salt. That's right. That's right. Exactly. <laughs> that's right. At the moment, um, at least through the end of the year, I'm doing a... Uh, You're doing I'm, a podcast right now. I'm doing a podcast at no, this Travis. very moment. And I'm no. drinking coffee. Um, <laughs> and then I'm going to go see a movie. Yes, yes, oh, no, yeah, a no. movie. Movie's always on the agenda. Uh, no, coffee is always on the agenda. Out. Um, yeah. uh, no, I'm out with Frankie Ballard at the moment. Okay. Um, so uh, I don't know if you know much about... Okay, he's uh, a young country artist that has had one album out so far that uh, he had the good fortune of, and I think it's, I say good fortune, but it's also due to, I, I really like his, I think he's a talented guy. Um, I like what he's doing. Um, but he, he released three singles from his first album. They all went to number one. Wow. So he's had three number ones in a row. Wow. And he's just released a song, I think last week, that is his first single from what will be his second album. Okay. Um, and uh, And I've heard that whole album and it's, it's really – it's very just like a band in a room, no programmed anything, no – like it's just dudes playing, you know. Um, and uh, Aaron Sterling's on drums and uh, it's a good band on it and it's uh, – you know, it's it's stuff that is – you know, it's just the kind of – it's it's – it's country today, but it's just rock and roll music, you know, and it's what I love. So I'm excited to be out playing with them. And I think they just they needed to finish their touring year. And then I think they're going to reassess. And so they needed someone to come in and kind of learn stuff quickly and hop in. Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. and so I fit that bill, I guess, just from my history and my resume, mm-hmm. whether or not they're going to rethink things in the new, new year or whatever, I don't know. As of right now, I'm on board for the rest of the year, and then who knows. Okay. Um, but uh, but that's what I'm doing at the moment. So, okay. Yeah. Going from 
the big and rich mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. to and Christian and then mm-hmm. Gavin DeGraw and then yep. this new gig. Uh-huh. Production-wise, the mm-hmm. way you monitor, the way you maybe run in clicks, not mm-hmm. run in clicks. Mm-hmm. How do, say, each in kind of those three different departments, mm-hmm. how do those vary? Because Gavin DeGraw is a completely different thing mm-hmm. than the yeah. actual thing. And I want to right. back up to the better than Ezra thing, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. just taking that snapshot of sure. the last 10 years or mm-hmm. so. Yeah, yeah. How does that differ? Um, how do those gigs differ? Well, uh, for you as your approach. Sure, sure. Um, the one thing that I'll say is pretty consistent at this point is almost everyone's on ears. So it's always in ears at now. Mm-hmm. Um, so monitoring that detail is, is pretty consistent across the board as far as um, as far as clicks and and programmed or tracks or whatever mm-hmm. uh, that's something that will vary from act to act mm-hmm. uh, pretty drastically mm-hmm. um, uh, like the Gavin DeGraw thing it, it's there there are some there's some measure of tracks or loops or something on I think almost every song or most of the set and even the ones that aren't you're on click the whole time yeah. the show runs it might be a little different set list each night but it runs very much the same every night as far mm-hmm. as um, occasionally there might be an extended little middle section or something like that but mostly the arrangements are the arrangements mm-hmm. and you know, because uh, there's a lot of video and a lot of light and cues and right. that kind of thing. And right. so, um, you know, that's an ex- – and so that was – we were running Ableton Live, which is a program that's you know, most guys are familiar with. It is a uh, way to run tracks live. Um, and the keyboard player was starting and stopping that on that gig. I was so I wasn't, even, that. I wasn't even running that on that mm-hmm. gig. Um, so that's sort of one extreme – and I, it, mostly I've found a lot of gigs are in between these two things. But the opposite extreme was uh, Big and Rich. No gonna, tracks. Yeah. Um, it's kind of up to the drummer. I, I think they like the idea that you might run click some just for consistency, which I agree with because – how much coffee you had or what you ate today for lunch or all that affects your – or most importantly, I've found the song you just played really influences your perception of what the tempo of the one you're about to play is. You that, know? Is, that is so true. Yeah. You that know, is it's so true. Just because you were just in a mode, whether it was a ballad or a super up tempo or whatever, and your heart rates at a certain place, all that. Yeah. And so where you think the next one is – isn't always going to be on the money. So the tempo reference is, is a valuable, valuable tool. But if, you, if you've if you done a lot of work with clicks and you've done your homework as a drummer and you have some also natural sense of time, all that, yeah. um, once you have that reference, like with Big and Rich, mostly what I do is because there's nothing, there's no tracks, there's no locking to a certain video thing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, you know, I would... I would usually, and I'm the only one here in the click in right, that band. Nobody right. else has got in there. I think Keo mentioned that too. Yeah. That, that, yeah, and so I would usually start a song with click, and and uh, once everybody's groove, and once I sense the whole band, including myself, knows where that is, just turn it off and just play music, and let's be human. You know, if John wants it to ramp a little bit in the second chorus because he's really hyped, that's okay. As long as it's not ridiculous, as yeah, long as it's yeah. not a hand, it, it, it still feels musical. Yeah. You know, I mean. That that is part of music to me, uh, you know. Depending on the moment, whatever is appropriate. But think about classical music; they're not on a metronome, the whole, you know. That's true. And so it's sort of the same notion. Um, but that said, groove uh, a big part of what makes stuff groove is consistency. Not and a big part of what's important in the consistency is feel, but also in t- tempo. Mm-hmm. You know, so you don't want things to be out of control, but to allow things to breathe. Yeah. You know, I, I think is cool. I like it. Yeah. Um, uh, so, but a lot of gigs like um, Sugarland, uh, we would use. There were maybe a quarter or a third of the songs that had some kind of track element, and so that we were running Ableton for, and our keyboard player was running the Ableton on that gig as well. But for two thirds, three quarters of the set, we weren't locked to that. And so on those, I just ran a click track that I could turn on and off because both in Sugarland and in Better Than Ezra it was a case where uh, Christian from Sugarland and Kevin Griffin, the front man for Better Than Ezra, neither one liked to play just to a click. They want to play to the drummer. And so mm-hmm. when the when I'm not playing at, at a, the beginning of a song or a breakdown of a song or whatever and they're playing by themselves, they want to be able to just play. 
and not be worried about something clicking in their ears. So uh, I got very used to being in Ezra for so long and us working that way. I, I have the my on-off for my click under my left heel to where I can keep my the ball of my foot still on the hat stand, but turn the click on and off with my left heel while still oh, holding that's the hat. Cool. Yeah. And so I've just got very used to turn that off and on in time as needed. Uh, and so I would use that both with Ezra and with, oh, with so Sugar Oh, so you're hitting yeah, when heel I, I, down. I, I can put my heel down on it and turn it off. And now we're in a breakdown section and guitar player's playing by himself. It's free time, you yeah, know, yeah. band builds, whatever, comes back in, we're rocking. But I know that later in the song, somebody's going to hit a sample that needs to – that isn't locked to the grid of the click I'm on, but it's it's timed – to fit the track, or there's going to be a video thing that is, it, we need to be back on tempo. Yeah. Then. So if it's at 122, and yeah. somehow, somehow you varied off. We that. varied off that. I kind of, just from experience, will make sure we're back at it or close to it, and then I'll turn that click back on. Yeah. And and now we're rolling on click again, you know, and so we're exactly at that 122 or whatever it is. Well, and I wanted to ask you about that because there's times that. In the middle of a song, I'll try and maybe use the click as a reference, and mm-hmm. I'll mm-hmm. use other tools yeah. to reference sure. the time yep. when I'm not using a click. Yep. But to hit that click, say the band's plan, to hit that click right mm-hmm. so that it's... Right on the money. Right on with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you able to do that with your left Absolutely, foot? absolutely. So what are you running it through? I'm running, it through? I'm running, it's, you know, usually I'm using either a Dr. Beat or most commonly a, an Elisa drum machine that have programmed a click pattern I like into it. Yeah. And I've got a little um, rolling foot switch, yeah. you know, that's hooked to the, the stop start on the thing. Yeah. And just bounce your heel down right on the downbeat. And you're good, or right on the backbeat. Either way, because usually yeah, the clicks, sure. you know, on either one. Sure. And That's uh, great. yeah, yeah, Love and that. yeah, yeah. It's, and your it, foot, your left foot. You're already bouncing in time. Yep. You, you just yep. you just slide the heel over and bam, you know, hit it on the thing on the downbeat, and and That's your cool, click back man. is back on. And if you're if you're worth a damn of what you're doing, <laughs> you, you're locked in with it, you know. But but now, you know, you should be you should be close or right on it it's really just a matter of then it staying consistent you know yeah. so that's a, a reason to get back on or like you say sometimes just a tempo reference like mm. you know if uh, there are cases where um, a song might have a big broken down long thing in the middle or you stop for a minute and the singer talks to the crowd and now you're going to come back in but you want to be back where you were mm-hmm. but you haven't been playing that tempo and you stopped and took a sip of water while they're talking whatever mm-hmm. you know and, and, and you, you don't that tempo isn't necessarily exactly in your head anymore mm-hmm. and so you come back into the song and you think you're close but you're not sure you can pop that thing off on and right back off again just to hear if the oh. first couple two three eighth notes you heard did yeah. they lock with you or not yeah. and if they were slower or faster than you then you you subtly gradually find your way back to tempo yeah. then yeah. turn it on again to check yeah. oh yeah now I'm back at it you know what do you think about like uh, sometimes I'll use like a beat bug or like a reference thing there's apps on your phone now that keep tempo that, you, that'll tell you what you're playing yeah. now I've never used them I've okay. never used them. I, I remember tinkering with one, and I'm sure they've gotten better. But like seeing one in a store 15 or 20 years ago, whatever yeah, the yeah. current version of it was then. Right, right. And and I remember, it, I think it, at least at that time, it was so <clears> – <throat> its perception of where the time was – uh, was was um, didn't seem consistent enough for me yeah. as far as because what if you're playing kind of a little behind the beat on the back beat but then in the fill you get a little on top and it's perceiving that as different tempos even if you're playing with the click because mm-hmm. your relation where you are against that click is a little different yeah. you know and so yeah. I've never <clears throat> I've never just I've never taken the time to mess with them just yeah. because I've found other things that work for me. Exactly. Whether it be and it obviously has worked for well, me. Yeah. So <laughs> that's the thing. Yeah. yeah so yeah. I'm not saying, hey, uh, Travis, I have an idea for you. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. No, you know, and, and that's the thing. And they they probably I'm sure for some people are valid. I just you know because I've yeah. found things that work. 
uh, that I'm familiar with and know how to do at this point, it's maybe the the old dog new tricks thing. Like I'm not going to pursue yet another way to check my well, tempo. Well, you know? and I think there, there's there's several ways to achieve the goal. Several ways mm-hmm. to skin a cat. And Absolutely. what you're doing is is working for you. The mm-hmm. end goal is to make music. Yeah, to right. make it feel good. That's right. Do. That's right. Uh, you reminded me of. I just want to interject this quick story. A, mm-hmm. a couple of things related to what we've talked about so far. Mm-hmm. The whole thing where where a drummer came in and played on a record. It, you weren't asked to do it. Kenny mm-hmm. was asked to do it. Yeah. I had a similar situation mm-hmm. with Steve Ferroni that mm-hmm. came in and played oh, on yeah, a record. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, with a band that I was working with. Mm-hmm. And then the next record, the next studio record, actually just came out this year. They uh-huh. asked me to play on, so that cool. was that was cool. But yeah, yeah. during the time that Steve was recording, tracking, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I was there, mm-hmm. got a chance to talk to him. Mm-hmm. And it was really sweet. This was maybe 2010. Okay. And um, I asked him about tempo. I asked him about mm-hmm. working with Tom Petty. And mm-hmm. Do you use a click? Do you not? Mm-hmm. You know, this mm-hmm. is... Pre-podcast interviews. I wish I had a recording. Sure. Going. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and I've read a lot about this. I'm curious to hear what he said because I've always been intrigued. I love that record, that first record he played on with Tom. And Echo. Uh, no, uh, the one before uh, Wildflowers. Wildflowers. Yeah. But anyway, go ahead yeah, with your yeah. story. Yeah. Uh, Echo's a really great one. Too. Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, yeah. Well, he he said most of the songs are not. To a click. Right. I think yep. he uses a click on one or two songs, mm-hmm. and it might be a reference. But I do mm-hmm. remember him saying, because I said, I use a click, and I'm the only one that hears it mm-hmm. on a lot of the original material that this mm-hmm. band plays. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we also did some covers and things like that. Mm-hmm. And um, sometimes, because the set list is so inconsistent, mm-hmm. I'll play one song one night, and mm-hmm. it will just feel great. And the next song, it won't feel good. And I, I don't know. He goes, well, I'll tell you. One reason why that may be okay. is it may be the song before it. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. And you reminded me of that. That's interesting that he said. I mean, that's the thing I've found that influences my perception of tempo more than anything else yeah. is whatever I just not only just heard but just played. Yeah. Like your your body has gotten into a physical motion and and how your – you, the natural state of your body at the moment, because of what you've eaten or whether you had a Red Bull or whatever, any of that, mm-hmm. um, uh, um, you know, is one thing. And how it interacts with the tempo of the song you just played, yeah, yeah. all that is a thing now that's yeah. like kind of – you just played a same tempo for four minutes and found a certain feel and, and like we're moving in a certain way. And that movement of your body in relation to your heartbeat at the moment, all is working a certain way. Mm-hmm. And now it's time to play a song that's like 20 BPM faster. And Now, you know, see, that's not a problem for me. The, the, okay, so for me personally, yeah. that's not the well, problem. Well, the slower one is the trickier the, one. The, the yeah, problem yeah. Is, is, is like right now, uh, there's a set, the, the band I'm working with, they have two new original songs that mm-hmm. they play. And sometimes when they put them back to back, I'm looking at one at 89 BPM mm-hmm. and the other one at 87 BPM. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, you're yeah, just yeah. like... Uh-huh. Yeah. I just okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. lay back in the Lay best. back a little bit because it's going to feel pretty much the same, but not quite. And you yeah. got to lay back. Yeah, yeah. Because you get my mind yeah. set and ready to go. Uh-huh, uh-huh. You know, on that. I'll tell you what, though. I will say, to me, I have found that, like, Big and Rich was an example. And over the last year, I've done some dates and some recording with Halfway to Hazard, who are a mm-hmm. duo, super talented. And I love those guys. I've been having a great time with them. Um uh, but the, both those acts, uh, the drummer's the only one here in the click. And when that's the case for me, I am not going to stay on the click the whole time because those – A, I hate playing all the time through the holes. I, I just think uh, musically – now I'm a metronome. I'm not playing music. I think it's lame. Like if there's a, it stop. We the drummer stops for a whole verse, but I'm going to sit there and tick out time. No, just let the guy play time. Mm. You know, let him play his own tempo. Mm. I'll get us back to where the band's supposed to be when mm. we get there. Mm. I'd re- as opposed to tick 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 the whole. Mm. So if the whole band's not listening to click. I'll turn it off in those moments, but I'll also turn it off when the whole band wants to ramp and I hear them all on top of the beat, but I'm hearing the click where it really is. And so I'm supposed to hold with the click and hold them back. That is a losing battle. And I'd rather have the band feel good than me stay on the click and their way on top of it and it feels like crap. So mm-hmm. I just turn off the click. Anytime when the everyone doesn't have the same reference point of the click, then that to me means click is optional. Click is reference. It's not yeah. dictating through the whole song yeah. because 
depending on the song, everybody's not going to hang with you. Now, if it's a groove where the whole track is the same feel, there's very few breaks, and it's not super dynamic, yeah, to leave that click on, everyone will sink into that groove, it'll be fine. Yeah. But if it's a song that really gets big in the choruses and is really laid back in the verses... Th- those guys that aren't here in the click are just naturally going to fight you because that's what, as humans, we do. We, yeah. The more exciting moments, we're going to want to go faster. And so you can't fault them for that. You just have to make a decision either as a band or I often do just as myself from my experience. If they, if they were that worried about the show being perfect time, they would all listen to the click. Mm, you know, yeah. Yeah. They just want it to feel good. Yeah. And so – when they want to ramp up a little bit and the click says no, see you click, you know, the band wants to rock. So the click's going to not be part of it at this moment. Right. And that's okay. And I'm talking about subtle movement. I'm talking about if you went back and checked, you might only go up one or two BPM. It's not drastic, yeah. but it's enough to let it feel exciting and let yeah. the band still feel good versus their way on top and want it to go. And I'm back here holding them back with the click. Like that's just, who does that serve? Nobody. That just right. makes shit feel right. bad. You know? And I think that that's, there's a time, there's times when, when drummers are like, no, this is, and I've heard different players do this, but mm-hmm. there's, you know, I'm here. You better come to me. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and there's that and, rock and I, solid thing. And I think that though, that is absolutely true and valid on stuff. That's just like, you know, like, I don't know, the first example that comes to mind is Love Shack by the B-52s. Mm-hmm. That just plows through at one dynamic the Steve whole Ferroni time. too on yeah, It track. may be, probably yeah. is. Um, it, it just is a, it's a same feel the whole time. Mm-hmm. It's not like way breakdown in the mm-hmm. verses. And now the choruses are like super exciting. You know, it's just, it's just a groove. Mm-hmm. And that, yeah, let, stay on that click because... It's going to hold that solid, right. probably maybe better than a guy would, you know. And so, yeah, if you use that as the as your benchmark, that works, you know. But on on more dynamic songs or whatever that have lots of breaks in them and stuff, mm-hmm. you know, and, and you feel the band fighting you, just, just make the band sound good. I want to go back a little bit and okay. talk about your upbringing. You're from mm. New Orleans. I am, yeah. And, um, and there's this ongoing debate of how you say that. If you're oh. from there, <laughs> you say it a certain way. If you're uh, not from there, you're not allowed to say it that right, way. Is right, right. I, I, I don't know. I, to me, I don't I don't think New Orleans people make a big thing of it. I say it in New Orleans. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I've got a friend that's not from there. Uh-huh. He, he always says New Orleans. Right. I, I, no, New Orleans, that thing is a little bit of an exaggeration of yeah. – I don't think anyone from there actually says it quite that. Right. But, but, yeah, but it's, uh, but it's not New Orleans or New Orleans. It's – New Orleans. New Orleans. And so when you say New Orleans, at least, uh, yeah, well, you New know, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, I guess the closest approximation writing down New Orleans looks like New Orleans. But when you read New Orleans, it's a bit of an exaggeration. You know, it's yeah. not really. Or NOLA. Or NOLA. Yeah, NOLA works. Yeah. I find if I'm typing something, NOLA is what I wind up writing just because it's, I don't know. For whatever reason, written down, that's what I wind up saying. But of right. course, I never really say NOLA though. It's just New Orleans. So your your background is you have uh, your father and your grandfather yeah. musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's the what's the story with that, and uh-huh. how big of an influence was that to you? Or uh, was it, it? it was that it was an influence to me in that. Uh, music was important in our house. So neither of them are drummers, mm-hmm. and and so I didn't even like particularly learn. Uh, anything specific about the instrument I play from them, but uh, but the, I would say the stereo was on in our house more than the TV. Like music was important in our house, yeah. And and both my grandfather, who played bluegrass music and country music, played guitar and lap steel, a little bit of pedal steel. As a, I think teens, maybe into early twenties, got married, started having kids, got a regular job, and then it was a hobby. 
And then my dad, totally different music. In fact, he and his dad did not understand each other when my dad was in high school, but <laughs> but still a similar process. My dad wanted to be John Lennon, basically. You know, I mean, it, it was the classic sort of, you know, saw the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and I want to do that. And look, dad has a guitar. And yeah. and so uh, high school, college, had a band, played regionally, um, uh, but mar- got married, had kids, got a job to support the family. And so both my grandfather and my dad did a had a similar um, went through a similar path um, and so both of them got to my grandfather only died a few years ago and so both of them got to watch me turn it into a career which was really fun for me to watch them enjoying me do it you know I mean that's yeah. that's been a really cool thing I've enjoyed in our that's family um, and so but just music uh, was I mean I learned a little bit of guitar from dad when I was younger and and we always had a piano in the house, so I'd bang around on that, mm-hmm. you know. And and I even remember, though, well before I even thought about drums, my dad talking about music, like a specific example I remember from, you know, way before trying drums. I remember him listening to Fleetwood Mac, and he's like, listen to Mick, Mick Fleetwood. You just never know what he's going to do. Like, middle of this verse, he just plays this fill out of nowhere. Like, what's that about? It's so cool. It's because it's personality, you know. And mm-hmm. like, so A, pointing out specifics, B, making me realize that that uh, character and personality in playing is important, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And also he was just – they they always had – Whatever was the current music at the time, but but the go to was always the Beatles and like sixty stuff that they loved. Yeah, and so yeah. I, there's I can't remember a time that the first time I heard any Beatles song because it's all since before I can remember, you know. And so all that's super ingrained and that's and great. you know so that that was influential to me in that way. And then even I didn't start playing drums till I was fifteen, um, and I and. I just I knew I wanted to do it. I was saving up money to buy a crappy little drum kit. And so during the six or eight months or maybe year even that I was saving to buy some drums, I was watching drummers on TV and see what they hit to make what noise. And so I would air drum. Mm-hmm. And so the first day I brought this little piece of junk kit home, my dad got his amp out and we were playing songs. I could play basic beats, you know. And so nice. so he, he was influential, influential in that way and that yeah. – immediately someone to play music with you know yeah, and yeah. and they were also my parents because my dad and his dad weren't on the same page when my dad was playing music as a teenager mm-hmm. when I was my parents were so tolerant and they would let my bands practice in our living room and right. they would let me make racket you know as much as my brother could stand they only put limits on me of how long I could play every day because I was driving my brother crazy which I understand <laughs> you know but uh, but it wasn't because they minded you know they were yeah. they were super supportive which was yeah. awesome you know? yeah yeah my kids are taking piano lessons, and they're they're always on the piano. They cannot stop playing. That's awesome. And it That's just, great. I hear them. It's just I have to go to the other room because I don't want them to see the tears in my eyes. <laughs> right. It's just bang, right. bang, bang. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They wear you out, but but or they've you, chosen uh, piano, not drums. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, for right now. Yeah, yeah. Not yeah. Fifteen yet. Yeah, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, and then. Uh, Maybe connecting, I say this mm-hmm. all the time, connecting yeah. the dots yeah. from that time into, mm-hmm. say, better than Ezra, mm-hmm. maybe. Mm-hmm. The, the time in between, basically, so I started at 15, and, and within six months, I was playing my first little cover band, and and within a year, I was playing in an original, that was the only cover band I've ever been in, was the first band I was oh, in. And then always, I always knew, I... I I didn't have visions of going to school to learn percussion. Mm-hmm. I didn't have visions of being a session dude. Like I just wanted to be in a band, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. And uh, so, really, and and I didn't. I wasn't thinking like, how can I make a living here locally by playing in cover bands that play uh, corporate parties? Or it was, I'm going to be in a band and we're going to get a record deal, and that's how I'm going to. That's what I'm doing. Period. Yeah. And. Uh, so first, you know, at, by 16, I was playing in bands with guys in their early 20s in bars, you know, mm-hmm. original bands. And, uh, and you know, a friend had a four-track recorder, and we were recording all the time. And, like, mm-hmm. um, you know, that was the pursuit, was was creating original music and, mm-hmm. and sort of, you know, uh, being just a gang of dudes in a band kind yeah. of deal, you yeah, know. Sure. And, um and then I, I got really fortunate. Uh, so happens my dad saw a uh, pre-internet how you found 
other people to play with or gigs or whatever was just the local weekly rag, you know. Yeah. And so by the time I was in high school, my family had moved to Phoenix, Arizona. And my dad um, saw an ad, said something about, you know, need a drummer for a tour, must have passport or something like that. Yeah. And dad was like, you should check in and see what this is all about, right, you know. Right. And so I called, I auditioned, I got the gig, and it was a – um, it was a band called The Wipers, and they were out of Portland, Oregon, and they started in the late 70s, um, and they were a punk rock band. Yeah. And um, and it, they were gearing up to do what was they thought at the time would be their last tour. They had just put out a record, but the drummer was gone. It was just a three-piece band. Um, and this is a band that I wasn't aware of it at that time, but once I did the research, turns out – and, and – well, I did the research then and found out, oh, they've put out a bunch of records and have a following. And much later, it became clear to me that um, they were inf- very influential to the – it's a guy named Greg Sage was the main guy. So okay. it was Greg Sage and this band, The Wipers. He was the guitarist, songwriter, singer. Um, and there was a tribute record to them later that included bands like Nirvana and I think maybe Mud Honey and Hole. Oh, wow. uh, yeah, like they – even though they were from Portland, they very much influenced the, at that time, the coming Seattle scene. Yeah. Um, and uh, um, so even though they aren't widely known, they were one of these bands that did have an effect on a lot of musicians that are widely that known. Are widely yeah. Known. But yeah. not that I had anything to do with any of that history of theirs, but that's the first touring gig I got was with that act. That's great. And yeah, so at 18, I think I was 18 or 19 years old, I went on a full tour with them playing to packed houses you know like and and i already knew this is what i wanted to do for a living but that just solidified it that was you know that was i just finished high school and i was like yep this is it this is what i'm doing period you know and they were using ableton you said yeah they were using Ableton. yeah there were a lot of click tracks on that no that was that was pretty much one two three four you know Uh, (laughs) you know and play fast and hard um and and it was great guys you're rushing yeah 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 yeah. they were super concerned about that no actually greg was actually he was uh it was interesting it was the first time i had and not that i had tons of experience at that point but to that point i had been Fortunate enough to just everybody liked what I was doing, and so I got, I just did what I did, and and then he liked what I was doing enough to hire me for the gig. But then he had a way in mind for me to play. You know, it included not playing rim shots on the back beats, which I always did at that time. Yeah. And you know, there were certain particulars he wanted. You know, playing very even eighth notes on the ride, not accenting the quarter notes, uh-huh. that, stuff like this. That was just part of the sound of that band. That for all I knew, that's how the old drummer played. But as it turns out, I think that's that was Greg's vision. You know, that's how he liked it. And so I had to adjust my physical approach to playing, you know, based on what he wanted. And I'm a kid and here's a guy who's had success. So I'm, uh, you know, I'm just trying to learn and and do it. But still, it was a a little bit of a wake up call of I don't have it all figured out. There's lots of ways to do this, you know. Um, So so I did that and I'll try and move forward fairly quickly quickly um then after that tour a friend that i'd played in an original band with in in phoenix just a local band had moved uh to the southeast and was playing in a band out of athens georgia Mm -hmm. and they were had an indie record deal and were about to sign a major label deal and their drummer was leaving the band he wanted to stay in school at, at at uga in athens okay and so um uh, so I went and auditioned. They flew me over to Athens. I auditioned, got the gig, packed my drums and whatever clothes would fit along with my drums into my little hatchback car and drove across the country and wow. showed up in Athens. At, yeah. And I was, I think, 20, uh, you know, yeah. and just kind of, OK, this is what I'm going to do. You know, and I, and I was fully aware that uh, that right at that moment in my life, I only had to take care of me and mm. my needs were simple mm-hmm. you know i needed a, a somewhere to sleep and enough food to eat to get by and you know so i could have no job or a part time job mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and sleep on you know in a in a like at one point i was sharing a two bedroom house with like four or five guys you know that kind of mm-hmm. thing well like we cordoned off the dining room and that was my bedroom like that kind mm-hmm. of stuff mm-hmm. and and literally go have chips and salsa at a restaurant for dinner buy the coke or whatever yeah, and yeah. that's dinner you know like yeah. but th- at that that's the point in your life when you can go you for can you that. can do that and so yeah. 
if I'm going to pursue this career that's an unlikely career, but it's the only one I want, yeah. I'm I'm going to I'm willing to do whatever it takes. Right, and right. and and I was just so sure of it, and I was. And and had opportunities that allowed me to pursue it, that that like going to school for it and all that just was never in my mind. I just I saw that I can do this right now, and mm-hmm. so mm-hmm. I never took lessons. I never, I you know I don't read music notation. I don't. I never learned the rudiments. I just uh, initially played along with a lot of records and played in my first little cover band and learned what I learned from that, yeah. and then just been playing in bands ever since, wow. you know. Wow. And so, uh, but anyway, so that band it was a band called Seven Simons, and the major label deal didn't happen, but we wound up signing to TVT Records, which was a bigger independent, and we toured around for a handful of years, and mm-hmm. and and uh, you know toured with some big acts at the time, and um, we're getting by, but we were it was a van and a trailer band, you know, sure, and. Uh, Meanwhile, I started doing some sessions in Athens and Atlanta. I just started getting asked to play on say, records and man, stuff. In Athens, especially at that time, mm-hmm. it was pretty hot. It was. It was a very active music scene, and yeah. so there was a lot to a lot of people to meet and, and get involved with. And <clears throat> um, uh, you know, so yeah, I wound up playing on records and stuff too. Which which wasn't uh, um, the little bit of college I went to. I did take a recording course, and before that, my friend, you know, I had a good buddy that we we had a four track and later an eight track. So along the way, I'm learning engineering. Uh, um, so then going and and playing on people's stuff wasn't intimidating in any way for me because I just always had this familiarity with recording process nice. sure you know and sure. so that was I think served me well yeah um, where the studio didn't feel like a pressure situation even though it was pressure in a, in a way that it, it never will be again because that you could not cut and paste you could not edit you could not fix when That's you're true. recording man you're just you nail it. From like right now till three and a half minutes from now, you hold your breath and you make it killer every note. And yep. and you want to rock out at the end of the song. You're taking your chances of blowing the whole take that was okay. just badass. But still, you got to go for it or, or what's the point? So, you know, like doing that, you know, the first uh, – 10 or 15 years of my recording career was yeah. that right. before Pro Tools, you know, and, and so that's a, you know, a, a lesson in itself that no longer will be. No, 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 no longer more. applies that's right. to there's a whole generation of drummers that mm-hmm. are working as professionals. Yeah. That never that don't have never felt that pressure, right? And won't, and that's not necessarily bad. It just, right. I think right. it taught me something that right. is no longer a lesson that just happens to exist because of circumstance. Well, it is interesting because because I went through that as well, and it's funny because now that you have that ability mm-hmm. to e- even punch drums, I mean, I mm-hmm. remember there like there's no way to punch in a part, right, right, you know, right, yeah, and so. Uh, it there there the positive of it. There's a freeing up of mm-hmm. you know maybe experiment. Hey, I want to try something here. Yep. Or if it doesn't work, mm-hmm. <laughs> I remember there was a there's a fill on a song. It's like you know I really want to do this, but I don't know if I'm ready to play it in the middle of the song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So because because I'm, I'm just working out the notion. Like it's complicated to me, but it's going to be awesome once I get it. Yeah. You know, and you kind of figure it out. So yeah. And then to, time, to insert it two minutes later. Is so, so yeah. hey, listen, run that click. I'm just going to play that. It was just a quick bit of the bop. Right. Just, I'm going to hit it. It just has right. some kick and floor and everything uh-huh, in it. Uh-huh. I said, just let me bit of the bop. Yep. Bop. Yeah. I did it like four or five times. Yeah. Find the good one. That was, that was good. Yeah. Fly, fly that in there. Put that in the hey, in this that little like, deal before the bridge is awesome. Well, yeah. And, and then, the thing is, you the the way in which it's efficient. I do is, it now. Lots, yes, you, you know. can learn to do it, and you can. And that is sort of the difference between session guys and touring guys. And in my mind, they thankfully they are becoming less of a different animal. Yes, but yes. but to some degree, they are. There is a difference in that. The session guy has to come up with the idea oh, yeah. and execute the idea oh, yeah. to record quality level oh. right now. Yeah. You know, whereas the touring guy gets to sit at home and shed it and figure it out, and mm-hmm. you know, and so that's kind of the that's why that's a higher pressure well, situation. To, it is, and to me, the thing that impressed me about session players that do it all the time mm-hmm. or have risen to the level of being able to be a quote unquote full time session player. Mm-hmm. It's not so much the execution, even though it's it's wonderful and it's brilliant, it's mm-hmm. all good. But mm-hmm. what impresses me personally more so mm-hmm. is that they're coming up with these parts mm-hmm. that work so well with mm-hmm. the song. Yeah. Even if it's super simple. Mm-hmm. It's like, 
that works so well. Mm-hmm. Thought of that. mm-hmm. That's great. Yep. And that's the thing. It's the combination of the – well, it's so many things. It's it's having great tones, uh, not only period but appropriate for the song. Like knowing – upon hearing something, having idea – a musical idea, but also having an idea of what the kit should sound like and mm-hmm. making your changes there mm-hmm. without having it, it. You know, so often that's not a big discussion. You just mm-hmm. go in and start putting the the muffle on the toms and mm-hmm. changing out the hats to the big mushy ones or whatever, you know, mm-hmm. um, and also think thinking of your part ideas. And as you're working those up. You real, which is a very very short period of time, like running it kind of once with the guys, probably not all the way through, because yeah. so often in Nashville it is full. Everyone's cutting at the same time, you know. Um, and, but then the next one, you're going for takes, and so you're trying to play these fresh ideas on a on a now a slightly different setup because yep. you've totally made these choices. And and trying to execute album quality, finished, done things that will now be the reference forever of what this song is. Exactly. You know, like all that happens so fast. And that's and, why you've been hired because you make well, those decisions. That's right. That's take right. it upon yourself to exactly. Make exactly. And in fact, that's really, you know, that's the the thing. You know, people ask about you know getting into session things, and and man, the thing to know is that so often, first of all, it's usually producer. And or artists making those choices of those people. Mm-hmm. And the the best ones don't hire guys that can just play anything. They hire guys who they like what they – they trust those people's musical instincts. They like what they do already. Mm-hmm. And then those producers steer the ship. But they have a room full of people that they already believe will – bring good stuff to the table Mm -hmm. Um, and so that's why it's hard to get in because most successful producers already have those guys you know and so um, but when you get those opportunities you you can play it safe and just kind of give them what you think they want or you can go with what you think is right and you're giving them some personality and you're giving them what you bring to the table as a unique thing and either they'll hire hire you again or they won't Um, but if they do, it's because they've they've they love what you're doing, yeah. and then you'll be a consistent call for them. Yeah. You know, and so I find that uh, you know hunting for the personality, trying to give the track a little bit of its own thing, can be really valuable in that way, both to the music itself and to you potentially getting work because someone likes what you do specifically, not just because you're another dude that can like stay with the click or something, you know? Mm-hmm. And so, um, well, and right. And you, and you sound good doing what you do. Mm-hmm. And, and, yeah. Yeah. And if that relationship buds, you know, it, if it grows, then yeah. you can, can always bring that in. It, there's right. that consistency. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So there's Travis, everyone. Uh, I think you can see why we're doing it in two parts. Some really interesting stories and uh, life lessons that I wish I had uh, 20, 30 years ago. So that was really cool. Uh, Thanks to Mike Jackson again this week for helping me uh, put this together, make it sound good, make it look good. Uh, We've done some extra work on the YouTube videos for the Nashville Drummer Jam coming up December 14th at the Exit Inn. Tribute to Alex Van Halen. So it's right around the corner. Check that out if you are in Nashville. So everyone, thanks again for your support. Appreciate you listening and your comments, and I hope to see you around. Bye-bye.